um, title and to be if, because to be called a female songwriter implies limitations. Well, it implies that it's not a real songwriter. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you couldn't imagine, for instance, saying Paul McCartney's a great male songwriter. Right. Well, they wouldn't do it that way. But I mean, it, this has always been true of women in the arts. We, we supposedly made some progress in this century. Mm -hmm. um, we got the vote for one thing. Mm -hmm. But if you take the female impressionists, there were several of them that were very good. And they were not really allowed to belong to the academy. There was an extra A in front of their name, associates of the academy. Mm -hmm. So, and it was said of them that they were incapable of really tackling the important issues that men could tackle that, you know, not that the subject matter of the Impressionists was particularly important, it was just mostly delightful. It seemed to me, people boating, people on beaches, you know, landscapes, so on. Yeah. But they seemed to think that women could only handle domestic situations, and Mary Cassette painted women and children very beautifully, and that seemed to confirm it, but she had all the chops that they did. Um, one would think in this time period that I came along, um, mind you, there weren't very many women writing uh, and singing. Um, there weren't very, very as many women as there are in the business now, definitely. Yes. There are only a few of us. But to use the expression female songwriter is to imply that the word songwriter belongs to men. Yes. Uh, so, so, it's, uh, so do they still in this country call you a, a female? A female song well, they tend to lump me always with, with groups of women, mm -hmm. you know, the women of rock. I've been always lumped in. I always thought, well, but they don't put Dylan with the men of rock. Why do they do that with me, with the women of rock? Always within the context mm -hmm. of the women that were happening. Within every decade, I would get lumped in, mm -hmm. in that same manner. One of my favorite compliments that I ever received was from a black blind piano player, Henry. I don't know as what his last name was. And he said to me, Joni, you know, you make genderless, raceless music. And I thought, well, I hadn't set out, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to make genderless, raceless music. But in some part of my, the back of my mind, I did want to make music that crossed. I never really liked lines, class lines, you know, like social structure lines since childhood. Hey, Vinyl Community and uh, YouTube music lovers. Uh, this is a, a feature from my record collection on the fabulous artist musician Joni Mitchell. Now, there, that intro, if it worked, if, if, I, if I was granted to use it, was from an interview in the mid-90s from a CD promo that um, Morrissey did with Joni Mitchell. CD promo, words and music, a conversation with Joni Mitchell and Morrissey. And uh, this was put out to radio stations and record uh, buyers, record uh, retailers, on the anniversary on uh, the, the uh, release of these two records. Reprise Records uh, was granted to do a greatest hits and uh, I think part of the compromise with the wonderful artist Joni Mitchell was to do a hits album and a misses album and they came out separately, all her hits of the time, or at least uh, best of in a way, and then one of uh, what she felt were the misses that didn't quite uh, hit the charts or the popular consciousness, but were great cuts from her record. But I'm gonna just go through my collection, Joni Mitchell, um, like I did with a fellow Canadian Lee, uh, Leonard Cohen on an earlier video. When I do these features, I like to kind of bring in a few overlapping things of, uh, of um, how they kind of got where they got, at least from my point of view and what I know about them. So these are never definitive videos, never definitive bios, or aren't meant to be. Just a showcase of the records and uh, maybe an introduction for some of you who just know Big Yellow Taxi and uh, Raise on Robbery. Uh, and, um, you know, Court and Spark. So here we go. Like Leonard Cohen again, she got known and got a record contract because she was a songwriter. And uh, one song in particular, The Circle Game, which Buffy St. Marie did on, uh, I think she did it first, I believe. I do not have that record, unfortunately, but I do have uh, this great album by Tom Rush, another folk singer who titled the album The Circle Game. Uh, the Beatle connection here, that cover was uh, photographed by Linda Eastman, who would soon be uh, Linda McCartney. 
It's always a Beatle connection if you watch my videos. Uh, Tom Rush, great, one of my favorite folk singers of uh, sort of the mid to late 60s, all through the 70s, really kind of a baritone type voice. Covered some songs, wrote some great songs. Um, we're not, may, at some point I'd like to do a feature on him or at least include him in a collective feature. But we're not here because of Tom Rush. But then there's Wildflowers, a, a popular album that uh, Judy Collins, who actually also helped, as I, if you saw my earlier video, helped get the songs of Leonard Cohen out in the world. And on this did two Joni Mitchell uh, songs, Michael from the Mountains and Both Sides Now. Of course, um, Both Sides Now was the one that became like the first big big hit for her. This was a, a pretty big album of the, of the time. And it got um, Reprise Records to sign uh, the fabulous Joni Mitchell. So without further ado, I'm gonna go through the albums. First album of Joni Mitchell is on Reprise, first album she did, and um, this is called Joni Mitchell. Uh, it's also known uh, song to a seagull, which is one of the songs on here. Michael from the Mountains is on here, that song that um, was performed by Judy Collins on that album. Pirate of Penzance, I Had a King. Beautiful record. Now, what was interesting, which is great, the power of Joni Mitchell, and I mean the power as an artist, not like power in terms of uh, powerful in a way, but sticking to her guns, the true artists, there are very few, I find, or a handful of artists that really, you know, stick to their guns and everything. When she got her contract with Reprise Records with the Warner Group, uh, she stipulated that she w wouldn't be forced to use an outside producer, and because she wanted her sounds just like she had been performing, what's in her head, which she wanted it pure, not what some record company wonk uh, thinks she should do. So she'd play guitar, uh, acoustic instruments, dulcimer, and uh, she, she's really kind of got known early on to do these really unique original tunings, and you'll hear it throughout, uh, throughout her career. But beautiful record. The Painter too. she did a lot of the artwork on this album as well. So, a beautiful record. Uh, this is a copy I got around 1972 or three. Oh, actually it says here, this is really interesting. It says produced by David Crosby. I'm not sure how much uh, David Crosby um, really actually produced this record. I'd forgotten about that. But uh, Crosby was the one who brought her into the, uh, when she left Canada, came to LA one of the Laurel Canyon uh, artists that um, held up in Laurel Canyon. And uh, there was just that in incestuous, wonderful collaboration of the arts, including David Crosby, Dan Graham Nash, uh, Jackson Brown, early uh, Eagles, even Melinda Ronstadt and some other artists uh, there. Uh, the Birds, obviously, uh, before that. So, in fact, watch Echo in the Can Canyon. Not the greatest movie, but a really solid, good overview. Narrow focus on a few bands uh, that really kind of started out that Laurel Canyon scene, including the Mambas and Papas as well. And um, there you go. Artist, musician. Clouds, another wonderful self-portrait, great painter. She did almost all the artwork on all her covers pretty much through her career. And it's just gorgeous. I mean, we could do a whole feature just on her paintings. So I wanna make sure I keep these up here for long enough for you to see. Now Clouds has Chelsea Morning, which uh, became a, one of her first sort of uh, radio friendly hits on FM radio. And um, Again, a beautiful, both sides now. Her version of both sides now is on here, ends the record. Again, another beautiful record. So, Joni Mitchell, Clouds. Now, this is where I came in. This is her third album. This is the first Joni Mitchell album I got, and I mentioned this on my 1970 video. Um, I got this because I was a member of the Columbia Record Club, <laughs> and uh, this was one of my picks. Again, a beautiful record, 1970. Um, Ladies of the Canyon, but the two songs that really stood out at the time, her version of Woodstock, which is a whole different thing uh, than the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young version that came out in 1970 and used in the Woodstock movie, 
and The Circle Game. Uh, the Circle Game is a song she, that she finally did herself, brought herself, that I showed you on those first two other albums. And also uh, Big Yellow Taxi, one of the first great environmental songs about the environment, how we're paved paradise and put up a parking lot. So wonderful record, uh, one of my favorite, and also, of course, you always remember your first. That's another reason it's my favorite. Joni Mitchell, Ladies of the Canyon, Laurel Canyon. Her most famous album, and the album that always charts high on the best of albums of all time. I'm not quite sure it's my favorite album of hers, but it's a fucking great record. Joni Mitchell Blue. It's an album, I think, that everybody who has, loves acoustic music, loves folk music, loves a hybrid of folk music uh, that's totally original. I think everyone needs a copy of Blue in their co connection. Collection, connection. Nothing to show, see? Um, no personal artwork here, but um, Little Green, the song Blue, California. You know, being a California native, uh, that song uh, really touches at the heart. A little more moody album, but a gorgeous record. Gorgeous record. Steven Still plays on it, Sneaky Pete, James Taylor, Russ Kunkel. Probably the first album of hers that didn't have all her own artwork. Just a beautiful photograph, but a gorgeous, gorgeous record. Then came For the Roses. Gorgeous record. For the Roses, Electricity, You Turn Me On on Radio. That's one of her uh, great songs. It's probably on the best. It's probably on the Hits album, isn't it? Yeah, You Turn Me On Like a Radio. Beautiful song. Uh, check it out. You know, all these records, to me, this first section of records in the, in the 70s are, to me, essential. Um, but I know there's a lot of videos I've been watching from vinyl community members that are paring down their collection. They're keeping uh, greatest hits. I get that, but I like to go deep in an artist's collection. I mean, very few artists that I could sustain myself with only a greatest hits. Really the guilty pleasures that I'm really not into anyway, but in a moment I want uh, a greatest hit. But uh, this is a great album. And of course, inside at least, we see some of her wonderful paintings and artwork. Plus, naked on the west coast of California for the roses. She finally breaks big um, with this Asylum Records. She's on Asylum Records, and this is her best-selling album of all time. Her biggest top hit, Court and Spark. Court and Spark, Help Me, Free Man in Paris, Twisted. Twisted is, a co is the only cover song I believe on there. It's a song that uh, originated from Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, the great three-part harmony vocal jazz group with John Hendricks and Annie Ross. Um, which is a great record. I mean, this really changed things. This is where she got more revved up with a, 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 a rock group. I mean, there's so many artists on here. Um, Larry Carlton got a little more, I think some of the members of, um, what's the uh, jazz group on ABC with, well, the Larry Carlton's on here. And um, I'll think of that later in this video. Uh, but but what a what a wonderful record! Just like a train, troubled child. I mean, her most popular record by far. Joni Mitchell, and again, her own artwork, inset. Artist evolves, artist changes, hissing from summer lawn. Now, this record changed things up. She started getting, uh, starting with Court and Spark, fusing a little bit with the jazz scene, the fusion of jazz. Uh, you know, she was into the, uh, obviously people like uh, Mingus and, uh, but the fusion artist, Weather Report. And she brings on, and I can't remember if this is the first record he plays on, she brings on uh, Jaco Pastorius. Let's see, 
don't know if he's on this one. Uh, oh, but Joe Sample, Robin Ford. Now, Robin Ford, another Beatle connection, went on tour with George Harrison, pretty much the same, almost the same year or close to the same year that uh, he goes on tour with Joni Mitchell. And they do, I wasn't gonna mix up CDs and vinyl, but um, around this time, they go on the road and do this fabulous uh, double album, Miles of Isles. And it has um, just a great, great artist. It has um, the LA Express, Tom Scott, Robin Ford, a uh, couple of people have toured with George Harrison that same year. This was a more successful tour in terms of quality of music, um, but a beautiful record. But this, um, this was really interesting. The Hissing of Summer Lawn. Some people didn't grab onto this. It's great photographs by uh, Norman Seif, who photographed uh, Joni Mitchell for many, many years. I saw Joni Mitchell three times, uh, three times in my life. I saw her when I was literally, just as when I got out of high school at the Berkeley Community Theater uh, in Berkeley. Beautiful place to see her, perfect place. There was an encore that Graham Nash, David Crosby, uh, Jackson Brown showed up for the encore uh, and, and sang with her. But um, then I saw her during that LA Express tour, Miles from our, our Isles tour. And then again, I saw her at the last waltz where she does Coyote. But um, this is where the song Coyote comes from. This is my white label promo copy, Hager, 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 I gotta look at it to read it. Um, Hajira, Hajira. <laughs> beautiful artwork, beautiful photography by Norman Seif again. She does Coyote uh, at the last waltz, but Hajira's on here, Amelia, Refuge of the Roads, promo copy. Gorgeous record. This is one of my favorite of this middle period of um, Joni Mitchell, and she really pushed her artistic endeavors and interest, bringing in a lot of jazz artists that will kind of go and uh, collaborate with her for the next decade and beyond, and uh, to the love and dismay of her record companies. Companies, including David Geffen, which uh, plays a part in one record, in my opinion, that uh, to, the, to the negative side of it. This, to me, is one of her most important records. Got a lot of flack for doing the black face thing, but it was patterned after um, a character, this pimp that used to follow her around in, in Los Angeles, down there. Um, Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. Now, she brings, this is where she brings in, I don't know if it's the first time she brings them in, but uh, Paco's on here, Wayne Shorter, uh, Herbie Han Hancock, she starts playing with. Paco brings in these musicians um, from Weather Report, mainly Wayne Shorter at the time of that period of Weather Report when Jocko was in the band, uh, the fusion jazz band. If you don't know Weather Report, that's something you should seek out and check out. A whole mix of uh, some core uh, jazz artists, but uh, some amazing fusion things. But um, this is a cool record, double album, really cool. And um, there, is um, an amazing kind of a drum piece that almost is very percussive African style. It almost sounds like Olatunji. If you know Olatunji, uh, has some records on Columbia, Drums of Passion. It's not Olatunji, I don't believe. It's not, but it has that sound, and it's really cool. Uh, so I would check that out. But the, the centerpiece of this album is one whole side, I, think, I believe on side two, called Paprika Plains has classical elements, it has uh, ambient elements. It's just, it's just a gorgeous piece. And the piece attracted the attention of Charles Mingus, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. Um, but Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. So Joni Mitchell meets Charles Mingus and they, kind of start working on a collaboration, get together, and um, Joni Mitchell works with a handful of artists doing a demos and just really kind of jamming and ex explorations. Uh, 
The artists she explores with who are not on this next record, she, Eddie Gomez, Phil Woods, Jerry Mulligan, Danny Richmond, Tony Williams, John McLaughlin, Jan Hammer, and Stanley Clark. Now, that's sort of the progress of working on this album. And she was going to um, do this whole collaboration with Charlie Mingus. And um, Charlie Mingus died right about the time they were in the midst of working on this record. Um, he's not on the record except his voice. There's a birthday intro of his birthday party. More of Joni's artwork. Now, there was some like pre-hype written about this record before it came out. Um, on it end, ended up being Joni, Jocko, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, Peter Erskine, Don Elias, Emil Richards on percussion, and the sounds of wolves from, I think the uh, Wolves album archive, uh, actual wolves. Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. Charlie Mingus song is on here. A lot of the rest of the song, uh, there was a mix of things written by Mingus with words by uh, Joni Mitchell. I think this is an album that is an amazing concept, but in the end doesn't work. I was disappointed by it. Most of my friends were slightly disappointed by it. Um, it's an interesting album for the collection. It should be just, there's something missing in it. It kind of falls flat in my opinion. There's no like center, like, like pa Paprika Plains in the uh, album right before it. There's no center focal point. Uh, there's one song that's a little upbeat. And not that everything has to be upbeat because um, you know, if you know Charlie's, uh, Charles Mingus's m music, it can be very uh, themes of classical jazz um, mixed in, but it didn't quite in the end work for me. I just listened to it again, just to kind of revisit it to see, hoping that, oh, maybe now it's the thing. Um, not quite sure. For the completist, sure. Interesting things, sure. Jocko and, um, you know, Wayne Shorter alone, it's always great to have them uh, mixed in here. But um, I would say I would get, um, not that it's the same thing, but um, Don Juan, Reckless Daughter is by far the better album. Not fair to compare, right? Um, it's a live album. I might be going a little out of order. Uh, this is a great, I mean, her, all her live albums are great. Obviously, there's two, as far as I know, there's just two. There's Miles for Isle and there's Shadows and Light. And um, this is a really cool hybrid of things. The band, again, is Jocko, Don Elias, Pat Metheny, Lyle Mays, Joni Mitchell, and the Persuasions, the great vocal group, the Persuasions that open up this series of shows, sings on a hit on some of the music. And uh, it's a cool record. I think there's a, a video. I've never seen the live video of this, but it's kind of a cool video. Joni Mitchell. While Things Run Fast, she continues on, on Geffen Records. Geffen Leaves Asylum, starts his own label. That was, I believe, the last one as well. Um, this, again, um, Larry Klein co-produces co it, who's a, a musician, bass player, works with her, and ends up, ends up marrying her for about 12 years. Excuse me, I'm taking a break here. Gesundheit. Um, Unchained Melody is on here. Um, this album, it's interesting. It, there's some mom all her albums have great moments, even the ones that don't fully work. Um, Steve Lukather plays guitar on some of this record. Obviously there's, uh, there's um, who else is on this? Larry Carlton, the great Larry Carlton gar guitar player. Lionel Richie. I'm not a big, as much as I admire his talent and everything, it just, that I, I just doesn't do much for me, especially when they're trying to mix thing in here. Um, Kenny Rankin is, and Wayne Shorter. Kenny Rankin's an interesting, kind of a folky pop guitarist that had a, had a moment and did some really cool stuff. A little uh, easy, on the easy side of things for my personal taste. Um, but Lionel Richie's on like 
a couple of cuts here. But Wayne Shorter, I mean, anything with, with these jazz musicians that she does, I love that she's said she tried this stuff, whether it worked or not, but I love this cover, one of my favorite of her paintings. I think that's what I want to get, is a book of her paintings. Now, <laughs> the Joni Mitchell Problem Child. Remember I said a little while ago about David Geffen, a brilliant man, record producer, entrepreneur, movie mogul, Hollywood, you know, <laughs> the Hollywood gay mafia in a way. Um, but this album, you can tell by listening to this album that the record company got in the way, which Joni Mitchell, when she sticks to her guns, even if she doesn't quite make it, her, there's some great stuff on her album. The problem with this album, um, first of all, the problem I have, and this is just a personal thing in, with a lot of 80s albums, I hate the 80s, 1980s flourishes of piano and percussion, that electronic-y thing. They work with certain groups and certain artists and you know I can go back and have fun and hear that great hit single that's from the 80s and you know it's from the 80s and it's you know you drive me crazy well that's a not that's a great song that's not a young fine cannibals but David Geffen suggested they bring in Thomas Dolby you know first of all she blinded me the science great fucking song one of the su our submarines is missing wasn't that also Thomas Dolby Great song, that first uh, album of his, great. I love Thomas Dolby. I love Thomas Dolby when he does Thomas Dolby. Thomas Dolby, to me, and Joni Mitchell don't mix. So this album is um, produced by Joni Mitchell, Larry Klein, the bass player Mike Shipley, and Thomas Dolby. Too many cooks, in my opinion. It's got all those 80s flourishes. You know, there's some good songs in there. Doggy Dog's kind of a cool song. I like that song, actually. Um, but there's too many strange things going on here, sound-wise, that don't work. At least when she sticks in the jazz fusion stuff, I get where she's coming from. It, it's pure to her. I know she was getting into electronics and, and synthesizers a little more around this time, as everyone was. Uh, but this is, to me one of those albums by an artist that when you go back, I just, again, I just played it to remind myself because I hadn't played in a while. I just, it, it wasn't happening for me. I, I'm curious if anyone else feels differently. But of course, you know, anytime you have her paintings, it's fine. So this is um, 1985. 80s weren't, <laughs> weren't pretty for some people, in my opinion. Okay. This is where I'd sort of jump on off the vinyl bandwagon for a while and um, pretty much get on to uh, CDs. And I stuck with CDs. Night Ride Home. Again, all these records, all these records, I, I call them albums, even though they're CDs or vinyl, doesn't really matter. Have some great things on them. Uh, Night Ride Home, an unremarkable record, uh, produced by Joni Mitchell and Larry Klein again. They're married at this point, they're doing collaborations. Um, you know, it's not memorable for me. I did not revisit it again before I doing this video. Just thought I'd show it for you. This one I like more, I know this one. I played this one a lot when it came out. Turbulent Indigo, again, She's influenced here by um, Van Gogh. Van Gogh, 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 Gogh. Uh, <laughs> kind of eerie. What a great painter. You know, again, the whole thing that disappoints me about these CDs is this small friggin' print. And I have progressive glasses, I should be able to read this stuff, but it's still, uh... Anyway, I think some of this is good. Again, not a great album, but not a bad album. That's <laughs> high praise. Uh, to continue with her, with her painting, nice cat. I love that she did, in fact, is that on there too? No, it's on that one. But I love how she really Again, if nothing else, just look at the artwork on this video. You can turn the sound off if you don't want to listen to me. 
to do a slideshow of just all these wonderful paintings of Joni Mitchell. better than the record in this fucking thing. No. But Taming of the Tiger, and this is um, late 80s, as I believe. Okay, we're gonna get into something now. Um, both Sides Now. Of course, revisiting her wonderful, amazing song, Both Sides Now. Um, this record, Again, co-produced by Joni and Larry Klein. And this is essentially uh, a covers record. It's romantic, it's beautiful, it's, um, I hate that glare thing. Yeah, that's why I like to take these out. Don't worry about me. Stormy weather, one of the great songs ever written. Um, I wish her I were in Los Angeles. It's it's a beautiful record. Herbie Hancock's on it, and um, I don't remember if it's around this time, and maybe I'm well, that'll be later. There's one record I don't, a couple records I don't have. There's two records I don't have that I'm missing. Um, Chalk Mark in a rainstorm from 1988 and Shine in 2007. I'll get back get to that in a little bit. I'm not quite sure why I missed those, but you know, again, I guess I'm not quite the completest that I thought I was with Joni Mitchell, but I'm pretty close. Um, and then, as I said, um, Shine in 2007, I believe it was one of her last records. Um, at the same time, Herbie Hancock put out an album called The Joni Letters that won a Grammy for best pop album or best album of the year. And, uh, you know, he played with Joni quite a bit and he did a lot of her material. This is an interesting album. This is called Travelogue. This is one of those albums people love it or they hate it. Um, it's orchestral versions. It's just her vo uh, voice covering her own material with big orchestras, very lush. And it's a pretty interesting record. If you're, it's, 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 it's gorgeous. It's, I would call it a gorgeous record. Again, wonderful paintings inside. Full orchestra renditions, some of her collage work. Um, it'd be nice to do a self-portrait video of just her work. She gets a little political uh, in her, uh, well, she's been political all along too. But uh, that gives you an overview of that. And I think has all the lyrics. I think I'm gonna end there. Again, I might be missing something. Uh, uh, there is a chalk, going back to chalk mark in a rainstorm. I'm not quite sure why I have that because that was in 1988 and I think it did fairly well and she does collaborations on that album with um, Willie Nelson and Peter Gabriel and Tom Petty. Uh, so that was 1988, that might work better. But uh, I'm a big fan of Joni Mitchell as you see. This is one of Mazzy's serious videos. It gives you an idea. Uh, I'd like to know what your favorites are, if you like Joni. If you don't like her, don't watch this video. Don't comment. But uh, like any artist, she has an amazing career. Uh, she has, she's basically retired from music now. She's been sick. You probably follow those things, but I'm not gonna get into that whole side of it. Brilliant artist uh, the, who I admire tremendously. She sticks to her guns which is not always a popular uh, take to some people, but Joni Mitchell, Canadian, to this day, she's between LA and um, British Vancouver, BC. She has like a large 
kind of compound or farm maybe, kind of farm-ish type thing that she's had since the 70s. And um, uh, wheelchair bound, but great, great, great musician. There's been recently, I haven't heard it, a 75th anniversary concert uh, that celebrated her birthday uh, last year that came out. And I haven't heard it, but a lot of great musicians on it. So um, to Joni Mitchell, both sides now. Mazzy loves you. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Make comments.